Good afternoon. Welcome to Capital Account. I'm Lauren Lister here in Washington, D.C. These are your headlines for Friday, January 4th, 2013. Is the stock market partying like it's 1999? I don't know. What explains the market gains over the last year despite the risks and arguments from some corners of central bank rigging? And who's buying when so many Americans have been pulling out? We'll ask Peak Prosperity's Chris Martinson and get his outlook for 2013. Oh, and talk about this. One billion, gajillion, fifillion, shabadoodle, million, shabadoodle, come and say, million. Yes. <laughs> or how about a trillion dollar magic coin solution to the debt ceiling? We'll discuss. Plus, after the Fed minutes came out yesterday, gold tumbled. Some are arguing the gold thesis in general is shaken. Some gold traders, according to Bloomberg, expect prices to rebound from the longest weekly losing streak in eight years. Here to talk about what is going on in the precious metals markets is Keith Weiner. He is president of the Gold Standard Institute and CEO of Monetary Metals. And our discussion of the dairy cliff sent some viewers over the YouTube commenter cliff. We'll pull the conversation back from the ledge and viewer feedback and deliver a special message just for your audience. You won't want to miss it. Let's get to today's capital account. When it comes to the macro environment, central bank policy and economic risks and their actual impact on stocks or any asset class, the results don't always make sense or follow logic. Don't we all wish in those situations we had a prescient knowledge of the future like this? Why not use your knowledge of the future to play the stock market? We could make trillions. Why make trillions when we could make Billions? A trillion is more than a billion, numbnuts. Our exhibit. You, know, you can't even. Maybe some people want everyone to zip it because it kind of seems people, some of them, often do not take into account the true value of billions or trillions when they get thrown around just carelessly right and left, like $600 billion in new government revenue over 10 years. That's how much the debt ceiling deal reportedly will raise. Does this really amount to much more than squat in the grand scheme of more than $16 trillion? Dollars, there it is, trillions in public debt and a trillion dollar coin or two. Could that really magically solve a debt ceiling crisis or stalemate if it comes to that? Well, Chris Martinson, author of The Crash Course, is here to talk some sense about billions and trillions and give us his 2013 forecast. There's his book, The Crash Course. You can see it right there. He also has a great series that you can watch online, very instructive. And thank you so much, Dr. Martinson. It's always so great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Yeah, so let's talk about the stock market because I have to say, if you look at the macro news that I've been reporting over the last year and then I look at the gains that the stock market has seen in the last year, I go, this just does not add up. And retail investors, we know we've seen report after report of them pulling out, being on the sidelines. So the questions that you raise, which are good ones, which is the interesting questions are why are people pulling their money out of a market that they no longer trust? And then who is doing the buying? So what are your answers to those, particularly the second one? Who's doing the buying? Well, that has to be the, the $300 billion question because that's how much money retail investors have pulled out over the past two years from equity mutual funds. In preference, they've been putting their money over in money market funds or bond funds or other places where they're obviously getting a very paltry, I think, uh, unnecessarily low rate of interest thanks to Ben Bernanke. So who's doing the buying? Listen, when you have $45 billion in, in fresh treasury purchases and $40 billion in MBS purchases every month, that's money that's going into the financial We're, we're having a few problems with Dr. Martinson's audio. We're going to uh, work on getting him up. Dr. Martinson, can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Oh, good, good. Okay, so just pick up when you left off. You were saying that when you have the Fed uh, buying $45 billion, add another $40 billion in MBS, when you have them buying these kinds of uh, bonds and mortgage-backed securities, that has an impact on the stock market. What, what is that? 
Well, it's it's clearly driving the market higher than it should be. Look, we have the Russell 2000 hitting an all-time new high. The Dow is within a percent of two of all-time highs. Same with the S&P. But the macro data, the stuff that you've been pointing out on the show, it's just sitting there with weak retail spending, with, with all sorts of measures that are clearly saying that uh, the economy is stumbling along now with this new tax deal that's in place. $60 billion a year coming out of people's pockets. It hits just about everybody. That's a drag on the economy. And then whatever spending cuts, should any obviously materialize, that'll be another drag. So I don't see anything here on a fundamental basis that supports where the markets are, but the prices are where they are because we now know the price of everything, but I think the value of nothing. The price of everything, but the value of nothing. So then how do you look at the stock market for 2013 when, when you think about your outlook? You know, is this an indication that it's going to continue this trajectory and shake off whatever bad macro news comes our way, which is likely to happen? Or does it mean, hey, 2013, really watch out because this could really collapse. There could be a huge correction. Well... If the old maxim was don't fight the Fed, I think we have to multiply that by some whole number, maybe 10. Uh, because it, it's really, we're not just fighting the Fed at this point in time, we're, we're fighting the Fed plus uh, all of the, the leverage that, that the rest of the financial industry can provide on top of 85 billion a month. Lauren, if you told me this was gonna be happening, like you teleported me here from five years ago, I would be running around with my hair on fire Yeah. An incredibly mm -hmm. difficult environment to make any money in. A, a difficult money to market to make any money in. So then where do you advise or, or think about when you, when you talk to just normal folks about where maybe they should be thinking about investing, where they can both have their money safe in 2013, but maybe hopefully get something for it, you know, unlike these low yielding instruments, whether it's bonds or in some cases where we've seen negative yields in the last year? Yeah, so I'm not a big fan of bonds at this point. I think they're absolutely going to be certificates of confiscation again at some point. I'm not a huge fan of the stock market, not at these multiples, maybe in some very select sectors, but Jeff, definitely not generally across the whole index uh, universe at this point in time. Uh, commodities still look like they're, they're going to have to run at some point here because the association between commodity prices and thin air money printing, very tight in the series, that still looks good. And... Uh, as I look forward in time, I still like gold and silver here, even though they've been getting uh, some pretty extraordinary bear raids that have been going on lately. But right now, the best investment for somebody with a smallish amount of money is still in their own infrastructure, in their home, very close to home. This is a period of time where I'm worried about return of principal, not return on. And I advise people to have some powder dry at this point in time, because I do think that the chance of a downside risk here is a lot higher than missing out on a bull run. Okay, that's, that's a good warning. And I'm sad to hear that trend still be one of looking for return of capital versus return on capital. People should get some return on capital. We've had financial repression for so long, uh, especially when you look at the tax hikes that are coming. This hits everybody. Payroll tax holiday is over. This is something that affects middle-class Americans. It affects, affects everybody. And of of course, we hear so much about the tax increases for the top bracket of those making more than $400,000. My question, the revenue that that raises is the $600 billion. You were writing about how this is kind of ridiculous. You know, what does this really mean it, it, when you look at the grand scheme of the U.S. debt and, and deficit, budget deficit problems? So let's imagine a U.S. budget deficit in the vicinity of a trillion dollars for next year. $60 billion, if all of that came next year, and it won't because this thing is sort of staggered and layered out over time, but if we even got that $60 billion next year, it represents about 5% of the deficit. So to put this in context, when we had a $400 billion deficit back at the start of this crisis, and now we've got one that's you know more than two times larger than that, this is an extraordinary event when Washington can't even find a way to trim more than 5% of that. Now, these spending cuts, if they actually do materialize, are anywhere from 1% to maybe as much as 9% of the deficit. So the total range here is going to be in the vicinity of, let's average it out, maybe 10% of the existing deficit. That's all that could be found at this point in time. It just means that we have a dysfunctional process. As I mentioned when we were running up these massive deficits years ago, I said, listen, don't be surprised when they turn out to be permanent. Washington can find ways to spend. They have a devil of a time trying to figure out how to save. And I don't think they're going to start saving until they're forced to. Market conditions are going to have to force this at some point. But with Bernanke enabling them, that could be a while yet.
So it could be a while, which is certainly a model we've seen in Japan, for example. Uh, my question for you, in the midst of this, you, t you talked about the dysfunction. One idea that we've been seeing tossed around a, a lot today, especially on the blogosphere, and by some economists, too, that I've seen actually advocate this, is this idea that the Treasury could have a trillion-dollar platinum coin deposited in their account at the Fed. There you go. Heidi Moore, actually, I think, summed it up pretty well when she said in her article, we can bring up the headline, she just wrote this today. People are getting real emotional about this, too. We do have it. I hope we can bring it up. But uh, she said in her article, mint the coin, why the platinum coin, or the title was why the platinum coin, it doesn't even work as satire. And she says, minting a new coin is very much in the interventionist mold of the past four years, but the Fed's programs don't require scouring the U.S. reserves for platinum and creating some unnatural currency beast. It can at least masquerade as an intellectual exercise. So at least with the Fed creating new money, we kind of have this idea of some kind of intellectual exercise going on. She's arguing, you know, with the Treasury just making this magical coin, this is just a new era of absurdity, whether people are kidding about it or serious about it. What are the actual implications of doing that kind of thing in terms of inflation and also uh, intervention? It, it would simply be for optics. So why spend the money on even $500 worth of platinum to run this coin? Just mint it out of plastic or something. It's the same exact uh, situation we already have. The Treasury prints up these Treasury bonds, bills, notes. The Fed buys them. The Fed holds them. And then the Fed redeems all of the excess interest back to the Treasury anyway. What's the difference between doing that and the Treasury going over and just getting money directly? Well, they forego the tiny bit of interest that the Fed skims to run its operations, which, by the way, is not a lot of money. So really, there would be no difference. It's just optics. It would just be a way for Washington to say, aha, we've avoided this pesky thing called the debt ceiling through some quirk. But it would just be, it's just mental gymnastics. It's, it's just a, a more clever way. And this is what I'm worried about. It looks like our, our nation's seeking to be clever rather than prudent. It, it's we're looking for tricks and gimmicks rather than a fundamental addressing of the, of the seriousness of the condition. The fact that you know we print money through one complicated mechanism or some quirky mechanism uh, through the Treasury with a coin, it's the same process. So that's the fundamental question we should be asking, which is how much is too much? Is there a bright line in the sand that we don't dare cross? But if there isn't, how, what are we really entertaining as risks here? We've already punished savers, mm -hmm. transferred about a trillion in lost revenue to savers through reduced interest payments, transferred that same benefit over to debtors, so that's really, there are a lot of messages coming through this that are very profound, yeah. such as what's our country really stand for here? Yeah, and uh, trillion dollar coin optics, I think, would be a new low of what our country stands for. But it doesn't change the fundamentals, as you point out, or the hijinks that really are going on when you really look at what the Fed's doing. Thanks so much, Chris Martinson, author of The Crash Course. My pleasure. And still ahead, how founded are the claims of gold market manipulation? Is there more than meets the eye or not? We'll talk to Keith Weiner. He's president of the Gold Standard Institute. And we have a very important message for all of you at the end of the show. First, our closing market numbers. Sometimes you see a story and it seems so whole and complete, you think you understand it, and then you glimpse something else. You hear or see some other part of it and realize everything you thought you knew, you don't know. I'm Tom Hartman. Welcome to The Big Picture. Soup of the day. My favorite radio guy in Fort Lauderdale is minestrone chicken sausage. I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television.
been on the move down since last October, and it tumbled after the Federal Reserve minutes came out yesterday. The idea being that rumblings of an end in sight for QE among Fem Fed members was not good for gold. Now, folks like Dennis Gartman, publisher of the Gartman Letter, writes that gold bugs who have operated on the thesis that the Fed has lost control of the money supply are in tatters. Other gold traders, according to Bloomberg, expect prices to bounce back as concerns mount that U.S. lawmakers are not doing enough to control budget deficits and people want to protect their wealth. One question that keeps coming up, we talk about it, is there more to the swings in the price of gold and silver than meet the eye or are claims of market manipulation unfounded? Well, Keith Weiner is here to talk about it. He's president of the Gold Standard Institute, CEO of Monetary Metals. He's here with his views. So thanks so much for being on the show. Welcome to Capital Account. Thanks. Good to be here, Lauren. Great seeing sunny, beautiful L.A. Wish I was there with that nice weather. Now, you're obviously a gold advocate, judging by your title and what I've read of your views. Uh, from what I understand, you advocate for some kind of a gold standard. Now, this puts you in the same camp as some folks who also happen to believe that the market for gold and silver is heavily manipulated. You disagree with them. Why? Yes, absolutely. First, I, I want to say I'm coming from on the same side, a friendly side to gold. Uh, at Monetary Metals, we're about producing a yield on gold, uh, earning money that way, earning real money. At the Gold Standard Institute, we're about promoting the use of gold as money. And so my criticism of the conspiracy theories comes from the friendly side saying, yes, we believe in gold, but in the mainstream, we have some perception issues. And I think these conspiracy theories are not uh, necessarily helpful. Well, what do you have that disproves them? Why, why do you disagree with them? Discount them as conspiracy theories. Okay, so um, I brought a couple of graphs. Can we put those on the screen? Yeah, we can skip down to those. So if we could take up the, the graph where the gold price overlay with a number of gold futures contracts, we have that so, up right now. So what do you think that this shows? I think, I think it's important for people to understand when a, uh, so this is a graph showing the number of, the open interest is called the number of gold contracts, uh, cont contracts excuse me, outstanding mm -hmm. is the green line and then the gold price overlaid mm -hmm. with the yellow line. I think it's important for people to understand that when you sell, there are two different ways of selling a gold future. There is a sell to close. So if, let's say, you bought a future on speculation because you thought the price was going to rise and then the price starts to go uh, against you, you sell that contract and that uh, is going to close that contract. Chances are the other party on the other side will buy it back uh, and then they make a profit on that. The other way is, of course, what's alleged in the conspiracy theory, which is you could create another contract out of thin air and sell it. So what this graph is showing, if you put that back up on the screen for a moment, yeah, sure. is that according to the conspiracy theory, the price falls because the big banks are uh, creating new contracts and selling them. But what we see is as the price is falling, and particularly I want to focus on the latter part of December. Mm -hmm. When I put this together, this was the most recent price drop in gold. Um, I didn't have a chance to see the, the price action this week when I prepared this material. But we see that the, the open interest, the number of gold contracts, is falling. Mm -hmm. And that suggests that it's what I call naked longs. People who speculate with leverage on gold futures are buying their contracts back, mm -hmm. or excuse me, selling their contracts. And that's why we see the open interest uh, declining. Okay. And so the, the, the conspiracy theory doesn't fit the data. So let's look so at what it. I, what I suggest, mm -hmm. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, finish your thought. What I suggest is that people think of this a different way than the, the conspiracy theory says, well, the banks are naked shorting it, and they present the banks as having a lame excuse, well, we are hedging our, our metal. It doesn't make any sense. Why would you buy the metal and hedge it? Mm -hmm. So what I suggest that people consider is that the banks aren't hedging their metal. They're arbitraging in order to make a profit. The banks are captive like everybody else to Wall Street, and they have to have a good quarterly earnings report. And so what the market is doing is it's saying, okay, to anybody out there that has credit av available to them, you can buy a gold bar mm -hmm. and simultaneously sell a future against it in order to make a profit for carrying that bar, holding that bar. And so I think it's important, and this is my second graph, to take a look at the difference between, or the spread between the futures price and the spot price. Yeah. which is called the basis. Yeah, so let's bring this up. So this is this shows the gold price, and it's overlaid with what you just explained is the basis, which is the spread between the price of gold futures and the price of gold metal in the, stock, in the spot market. So how does this show there is not manipulation going on in the market as you contend? So f first of all, it's really interesting to note, this is, so the basis is quoted as an annualized percentage. 
This is what a bank can earn by buying spot gold at any given day. You can see the, uh, that green line shows the other value. And it roughly is between 0.6% and 0.65% uh, pretty much. Now, then that's for, hold, that's for buying spot gold, uh, let's say, on the 18th of December 2012 and selling a 20, December 2013 gold contract. So it's roughly one year. So by comparison, if, if the bank were to buy a one-year uh, treasury security, those things yield less than 0.2%. Mm -hmm. So from the bank's perspective, it's simply much more profitable to carry gold than it is to carry a, uh, a one-year uh, treasury note or treasury bill. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that graph shows is that if the banks were, so the conspiracy theory says the banks are selling um, futures naked. Mm -hmm. If that were true, then what, and, and, and driving the price down, as you can see from the gold line, you know, the price has, has been dropped over $100, certainly from September. Mm -hmm. And I think that, uh, you know, peak to trough from mid-November to uh, December over there is almost $100, $80, something like that. Mm -hmm. um, if that were true, that would push that green line down because the banks are only selling a future. Mm -hmm. They don't have, especially in silver, they don't have the silver to sell. So they're selling only the future. That would drive the price of the future right, right you know, $100 down while the spot price is still holding steady. So that green line, that spread of future price minus spot price would fall completely off the bottom of that graph uh, and become negative. And it which is, is called backwardation. I was going to say, that's what's called backwardation. I, I know we don't have a lot of time to get into that, but, but you're arguing that, that here, um, what's the relevance of it? Just a simple explanation. Well, it's, it's just like in physics, you know, when Einstein says uh, that gravity is going to bend light a certain way or something like that, you like to get to the point where you can then observe real data and say, well, if the theory is true, we're going to see light going to the left, and if the theory is false, we're going to see right, light going to the right. Mm -hmm. So we now have a situation where if this theory was true, Whenever the price dropped and the, and the conspiracy theorists say that it's manipulation, we should see the basis completely falling off a cliff into the abyss. Mm -hmm. And we don't. So what I would suggest to viewers is on our website, monetary-metals.com, mm -hmm. we're going to have a, a follow-up piece for viewers where we can present a lot more information about backwardation and, and go into more depth than we can uh, in, in a short Interesting. Clip on, and quickly, on I, I just have 30 seconds left, but what do you attribute the drop? in gold recently to, if not to manipulation, what's your theory if you have one? 20 seconds too, I got, you have here. Um, that's interesting, I and mean, obviously everybody enjoys having an opinion, and myself included. I think we have to resist the urge to say that every blip in the market has to have a, an easily point-outable reason that we can say, oh, well, that's it. Uh, personally, I suspect that liquidity conditions are getting tighter, both in China and in Europe and people have to liquidate assets, especially where there's a firm bid as there is in gold and silver, mm -hmm. uh, versus you know, bonds in, in Europe and other things where it's much harder to liquidate. So they find whatever's not nailed down and they liquidate it and you, know, you see these sell-offs. I think going forward, mm -hmm. it's obvious that the price of gold and silver is gonna continue to rise. We shouldn't cheer that because that's really not gold going anywhere, that's the dollar going down. Yeah, because um, a great and point. Secondly, we should, we're going to we have expect. to end it there. We're out of time. I didn't mean to cut you off, but you got so much great insight in there. I really appreciate you being on the show. Really interesting stuff. All right. Thank you. Take care. You too. up with viewer feedback and Dimitri is joining us for this one because what's more fun than having just me respond to viewer feedback what's more fun is having me and Dimitri respond so Gibson V log said earlier this week I would love to see Colin Roche come into the studio for an interview with some better audio his approach seems very interesting this got so many likes it got more than a dozen at least the last time I checked which was a while ago and we're so sorry that his audio wasn't better but yes he has such interesting um, insight and you can always go read more of it on his blog he has pragmatic capitalism that's his blog tw skeptic represents what many people felt about dimitri in my discussion about the dairy cliff he or she said rt is anti-milk 
The argument is because we're the only mammals who drink milk of other animals. How is that a good argument? We also eat rice and beans, which, or excuse me, grains, which can't be eaten raw and no animal eats. If you can't explain what the health issues are, then why even give an argument? There's nothing wrong with raw milk. The problem is government doesn't allow farmers to sell it. Well, thank you for your feedback. Let me draw these people off the comment cliff because I would like to point out that there are plenty of health problems with milk. Dimitri, maybe you want to weigh in, but I was looking at the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They say prostate and breast cancers have been linked to consumption of dairy products, uh, contaminants from pesticides, drugs, hormones, uh, both natural and synth synthetic are found in cow milk. Type 1 diabetes is linked to <laughs> consumption of dairy products. Uh, they pose risks for children. They encourage obesity. Guys, and I, and I should just say, I mean, look, the reality is if 60% of adults can't digest it and they end up passing gas nonstop as a result, you know there's something wrong there, right? You shouldn't be drinking it. Yeah. All right? And it puts you to sleep. Why? Because it coats your stomach. Yeah. Worse than all of those health problems is... The yeah, that's absurd. That it doesn't make sense. It shouldn't be. Yes. I'm with you there, Lauren. Okay. Unfortunately, that's all the viewer feedback we have to get to because we have a very important announcement. This is actually hard for me to say. I think I'm going to get emotional. Um, this is our last capital account. This is our last day on the show. Uh, it's been an amazing run, a little over a year, a year and some months. Feels like a lifetime because we've really poured so much of our heart and soul into this. And it's time to move on to new things. And I just want to thank so much all of our viewers who have been so supportive, all of our guests who have been so supportive, the ones in the beginning who gave us a chance when they didn't even know who we are, our staff for being amazing and putting up with us, our producers, our entire team. Dimitri, you've made my dreams come true. I don't Likewise. know if you want to add something. No, oh, I mean, likewise, I've said that before, Lauren. I guess I would just say, um, and then I want you to continue because uh, the audience has known you for so long. I just say I'm very, it was very grateful. I'm very grateful to everyone and to the audience especially. You guys have been really remarkable. It's been a real pleasure to produce something that we all enjoyed, something that I felt was missing before I came to RT and, and worked on this show and created a capital account. And I feel uh, you guys really, I, I thank you for coming and watching every day and and showing the the ability to to look for something deeper I guess yeah. a little bit. something well, deeper and thanks so much to RT for giving us the opportunity to do the kind of show that we wanted to do the kind of show that pushed the envelope and did some things that aren't conventional on TV like long in-depth interviews which ended up being a huge hit mm -hmm. um, so I just can't thank RT enough for the opportunity to do this and lest we drag on and on and droll on about this. We are going to say goodbye for good because that is our show for today. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, be sure to keep looking for, for ways we'll be around. to, You'll find us. to get to this information. Um, you know you can follow us both on Twitter at Lauren Lister and Dimitri at Covering Delta. Go like our Facebook page one last time, facebook.com slash capital account. We'll have a message there. In perpetuity, you can watch our videos at youtube.com slash capital account and hulu.com slash capital dash account from everyone here at Capital Account. Thank you so much for watching and have a great night.